So, what did I learn for, for present day? I learned a number of things which made me very proud of pharmacy and made me reinvest in the way in the, in the history and the importance of the history, which is why I'm glad about the centenary theme. Because, and I'll just sort of put them out in no particular order. One thing is we were at the front of free trade. Remember the free trade movement started in the late 1700s. You know, it had all been restricted, guilds, no one could do things, everyone was controlled. It, you know, it, it was uh, there were lots of um, barriers to, to anything happening. And free trade was one of the things which made Britain great and which made it such a great trading nation. It was so important for them. And they were just, you know, everything was being swept before Britain with, with free trade. And so, um, I was talking to the historian, or a historian who was talking about poisonings, about the, the Arsenic Act in 1851 or two. Um, and I said, it was, you know, it was really limp, wasn't it? Because basically, anyone could still sell arsenic, whether you're a baker or a candlestick maker or a cobbler, you could still sell arsenic, but you had to write down who you gave it to and how much. Um, and he said, no, he said, that was the first control of free trade in the country. There were questions in the House of Parliament. There was all sorts of problems about it. And it was watered down to, to get it through. But it was very significant symbolically. So pharmacy was at the forefront of this tension we have now between regulation and free trade and entrepreneurial activity. So that, that was uh, one thing. Second thing was pharmacists were at all levels of society. They were in the Royal Society and they were also in the poorest villages um, where they would not be, they'd just be a, you know, a slight level higher than the people who they were serving and, and providing to. So, uh, and it was a very risky business in those days. You know, the chemist and druggist each month had a list of all the bankruptcies of pharmacists which had gone on. And we managed to get a shift in the, in the crew, I think, and in the, in the presenters and, the, and the, the management of line. Whereas, first of all, it was seen very much as, um, you know, well, I said pharmacists making some profit. And you'll hear the word profit quite a bit in the first couple of episodes. But I managed to get them to, to shift. And I think just by seeing things and realizing things, they realized that, you know, it's inappropriate to be, it's, it's a funding model, which I'll, I'll come back to. So, it, you know, people were taking risks. They were working enormously hard. 12-hour pharmacies were, were no problem in those days. That was, uh, that was sort of minimum opening. Um, the politics of the society and the, the fun we've had over the last few months and years, who should be in it, who shouldn't be in it, whether you want to open things up or not, trying to work with Parliament, all these things were all happening in the past. All the lessons were, were there and... and ignored by many over the last, uh, last few months. Relationship with doctors, um, I think, was just fascinating me because basically they haven't changed in 150 years <laughs> and we're still floored by them. How pathetic of us. We really need to get our act together and that's one of the things we're hoping to do with uh, one of the pharmacy charities, Petco, is to just start formulating the arguments to deal with things. There's a piece in the FT in the Financial Times Weekend um, magazine about a month ago by Margaret McCartney, who's there, um, who has a regular column in that, saying basically, don't go to your pharmacy for advice, you know, come to your GP. Your pharmacist's not going to go out at four in the morning, <laughs> just like your GP isn't. Um, but, and I wrote to her, and it was a, a fairly sterile correspondence in the end, we didn't get very far. But there's a piece in The Guardian as well, which I wrote, and I wrote a comment column in The Guardian in the end um, from Steve Field. Well, it was, it was an article which quoted Steve Field and others from the Royal College of General Practitioners about pharmacy and, you know, they don't give things which have an evidence base and so on. And doctors have been saying that about pharmacists for 150 years, and we still haven't got our argument structured or well organised or put a counter a set of arguments out there. And... You know, now is not the time to rehearse them all, but the, the thing about evidence uh, and so on has been a, a constant theme. Now, ironically, in Victorian times, of course, particularly the early Victorian times, certainly we know that what the doctors were giving and what the pharmacists were giving were just as effective or ineffective as each other. Now the doctors have access to things which we don't have access to and may be more effective, but also 
we have things which, uh, which we can give. My mother um, had a, a couple of minor strokes before Christmas, and she's generally very well, she's 90, but her, she finds it difficult to clear her throat and talk at times. So we just went into the pharmacy, and we had one each of all the lozenges which were there, we had a pack each, and we tried them, and Vocal Zones did the trick. Formulated for Caruso, I found out. Uh, I bet there is not an evidence base for those. I bet there's not a meta-analysis which shows they were. But by God, my mother can talk now and he loves it. And it was a real problem for her before. It was embarrassing and so on. The quality of life which came out of that was enormous. And to say that somehow that is weak or poor or second class is inappropriate. Um, so we need to get those arguments uh, sorted out. The final thing is, or coming back to this issue of profiteering, and we need to be supporting, promoting the retail model as the patient-centred model of healthcare, because that's what it is, you realise. You know, it was us in the past, it was us using our skills to deal with patients' problems, and we were patient-centred. So poor old Mr Bird, whose, whose wife was both... Um, uh, allergic to yeast and to um, what else was she allergic? Eggs. And he, so he came up with bird's custard and with baking powder, using his chemical knowledge so that she could have a better quality of, of life to deal with her, her allergies. And we used to make things, we don't make things now as we, we know, but we know about those things. We can advise how well to use them. You know, when you go and buy a new smartphone or a digital camera or something, you just worry about it, you know, you get it, you start playing with it, and some bits work and some things you can't do. You just wish an expert would be there on hand to help you. And we could do that as pharmacists. That's where our value will be. You know, I live 200 yards, uh, 200 yards, 200 miles from my mother, who lives alone. You know, I would pay a pharmacist good money to be checking on our medicines and talking with her and adding that value of using their knowledge to get the best out of those medicines and to reduce the harm which we all know medicines can cause. I've been doing some research on pharmacists where we've been observing them in, in community pharmacy and we're doing it. We're also looking at the repeat uh, prescribing process in GP practices, working with a professor of general practice, Tony Avery at Nottingham, who I've worked with very happily for many years. And we, you know, so we, we, uh, we get on very well together. And he was saying, oh, what, what's amazing, what's amazing, he said, these pharmacists, Somebody comes to the counter, a patient comes to the counter, they stop what they're doing and go and talk to them. It's really dangerous. <laughs> we said, I said, well, you know, we find it really surprising that when we take a repeat prescription in, it takes you three days to get it back to us. <laughs> you know? And it sort of epitomised the model, really. You know, the average time research shows from asking to a pharmacist to getting a pharmacist uh, to talk to you is 90 seconds. Where else in healthcare? You know, the current white paper is about patient-centeredness, no decision about me, without me. It's been talked about for ages. It's always bogged down in the, in the professions and so on. And it's time we recognise that actually the retail model is one way to deliver that because it does put the customer, the patient first. It is patient-centred. I think we need to start working that argument up and promoting... Uh, that argument. So I hope I've given you a taste of what the programme was like and also about some of the, the key themes which are there, which emerged, and some of them you know, were, were an education to me, um, particularly this thing about the, the power of, of retail and the patient-centredness of it, and are, you know, instead of saying that's a bad thing, we say that's a good thing, because we're actually giving patients what they want. Um, and I think some of these things give us a sense of the future as well. We've gone from making things in the past and being immensely creative and entrepreneurial and lost our way a bit at the moment, I think, beginning to find it. But it's all about making use of our knowledge and making use of our knowledge of medicines to, to help move things on. Um, what's been the effect of the Victorian pharmacy? Uh, well, A.A. A. Gill wrote um, a review a.a. Gill, who's recently been censored by the, the Press Council, and I've never been impressed with, I must say. He wrote, one of the rules of television is never watch anything with Victorian in the title. <laughs> it will inevitably be horrible, mawkish hokum. 
Another rule is never watch a documentary where the presenters dress up in amusing or historical costumes. So obviously, anything that involves Victorians and dressing up is to be avoided. So I'm at a loss to tell you quite why I enjoyed the Victorian pharmacy as much as I did. It had chemists gussied up and presenting like extras from Lark Rise to Candleford and recreating 19th century boots. That doesn't sound promising, I know, but it was compelling. Now, clearly I've misjudged this man. He is <laughs> far-sighted, in fact, a genius, I think. People have asked whether, uh, you know, I'm guessing, uh, first of all, is there going to be an, another version? Well, the answer is, you know, I'm resting at the moment, darlings. I'm just <laughs> waiting for my agent to call, you know. <laughs> just thought I'd do this gig on the afternoon. I hope it gets a bit more publicity. Um, and the second thing is, am I recognised, you know, have I been asked for autographs and so on? Well, I get better service in the butchers now than I used to do <laughs> in our street, uh, which is good. But I'm hoping that now the book's come out, um, because there's a book being produced. We had nothing to do with the writing of the book. It was actually done, virtually finished, before we'd finished filming. Um, but now that that's out and my picture's on the cover, I'm hoping that I'm going to be recognised widely in the street. <laughs>